I'm going to talk to you all today about urbanization because it's a deeply personal process for me. You see, I'm a small town girl from the United States who moved to the city. New York City, to be exact. And growing up, I saw cities as sites of prosperity and diversity and innovation. And I knew that's where I wanted to be. You see, soon cities will be home to 80% of our global population. And I'm a wave of the people that are moving there. But when we talk about urbanization, we focus on where people end up in the cities. But I've been spending a lot of time back home lately and thinking more about what pushes people to cities to begin with. What happens to the communities that we leave behind? But before I tell you about that, I want to introduce you to my hometown. So I'm from Tams, Illinois. It's right in the center of the country where the Mississippi and Ohio rivers meet. And I consider this area to be the crossroads of US history. You see, nearly every major migration of people in the US has come through this area. We had the Lewis and Clark expedition that expanded our country westward. We had the Trail of Tears, where Native Americans were forced by their governments from the, their ancestral lands. We had the Underground Railroad, a network created by enslaved Africans to escape to freedom. And then we had the Great Migration, where six million black people moved from the south of the country to the north in one of our greatest moments of urbanization. And it's a really beautiful area. It, there's hills and lakes and rivers. There's some great hiking. And the area was a shipping powerhouse in its heyday. You see, if the Erie Canal hadn't been built and given New York City access to the center of the country, my area could have been the economic capital of the United States. But when I was there, I didn't appreciate any of that. I didn't appreciate the beauty or the history. I saw it as a prison, much like the one that put my town on the, tap, on the map. You see, this maximum security prison was the hope for economic revival in the area when my family moved there in 1993. And it desperately needed it. When we arrived, the area was mostly underwater. It had just been hit by a massive flood. And that's just one of the many tragedies that's befallen this area. Decline started when that river industry that I was telling you about gave way to railroads in the 1930s. And then in the 60s, we had a huge flight of white businesses from the area because of civil rights uprisings. And then, of course, the area was impacted by the national flight of manufacturing. Now the area just has 650 people, and the per capita income is $10,000. My hometown is representative of many of the pushes that drive people to cities. The flight of business, natural disasters, various forms of bigotry. And I'd always knew that I need to leave to build a life for myself. I didn't question that. And so I did. I ended up in Brooklyn, New York, but that transition wasn't easy. You see, urban migration isn't just a geographic process, it's a cultural one, too. When I moved to the city, I felt some stigma from being from a rural area. People saw me, my backgrounds as kind of backwards, and so I worked really hard to become cosmopolitan. I started traveling, and I learned languages like Spanish and French, and that combined with the remoteness of my hometown. I have to tell you, I joke that it was easier for me to get to China than it was to get back to my hometown. That combined with the remoteness, I grew kind of distant from my family. But I saw that as normal. I've talked to a lot of small-town kids in cities who have very similar stories. And so I thought it was normal, and I'd established myself, and even though my family and I didn't see each other that often, they told me they were proud of me. And so it all seemed worth it. Until I got a call in April of 2015 from my brother, who told me that he'd found my mom on the floor unconscious and that she'd been rushed to the emergency room. So I get on a plane and I go home for the first time in five years. And when I got home, her prognosis wasn't good. The doctors told me that if she survived, she might face brain damage or severe physical impairment. And my brain raced. I had no idea what we would do. She didn't have great insurance, and I couldn't put her on mine. That's not possible in the US. And I thought I might need to move back home. So I started thinking about what would I do? Where would I work? I have this pretty esoteric job that I can't even describe to people back home, let alone find a job doing it. So I started thinking that I built this life for myself in New York that I was so proud of that was keeping me from my mom when, I most, when she most needed me. And in that moment, it was New York City and not Tams that felt like the prison. 
So I walked through my town to try to clear my mind, and when I was there, it was worse off than I even remembered it when I left. There were more shuttered businesses. It was a weekend, and I saw no children on the streets. People had told me that there was a mess addiction problem in the area now that it had gotten pretty bad. And in that moment, I realized that I was an economic refugee. I couldn't see the pushes that, or the pulls that shiny things that pulled me to the city. I could only see the things that were pushing me there. And I was an economic refugee, one of millions of people who flee bleak birthplaces and move to cities hoping to be able to build lives for themselves and maybe support their families from afar. And in our wake, we leave these dying towns, whole generations vanished. And looking around in my town, I felt heartbroken and helpless. Fortunately, my mom, after weeks in the hospital, made a complete recovery, and I'm so grateful for that. But the feeling of hopelessness and helpless that I felt when I was there with her really stuck with me. And I didn't really do anything about it until the election gave me this kick in the pants. So I have to explain to you what the mood was in the United States after the election. People were traumatized. We woke up that morning not recognizing the country that we had grown up in thinking that and realizing that it hadn't evolved as much as we thought it had. And we were trying to find answers. The only thing you could read right after the election was analysis of why the results turned out the way they did. And I poured over them. And I found a recurring culprit, urbanization. Or more specifically, this idea of the big sort. See, we are becoming more politically polarized as people move from the conservative, rural, in the middle of the country to the urban liberal coasts. And the stories that we've sort of started to tell ourselves from that fact is that we have this bubble of people, liberal elites, that really just don't understand the disaffected white working class in the center of the country. And we have to really do more for that community because they've been hit so hard by economic struggles. Now, that narrative bothered me because I'm from one of these areas in the middle of the country, and I knew that it wasn't just the white working class that was affected, and I also knew that there are millions of people who straddle this rural-urban divide that understand both the reality of the city and the country quite well. And then, in fact, our struggling rural and urban areas are connected. Take, for example, the neighborhood that I live in now. It's Bedford-Stuyvesant. And it's really quite urban. People think of it and they think hip hop, it's the home of the notorious B.I.G. And there's graffiti and there's urban buildings. It's maybe the last place you might think to look for a rural urban connection. But it's there. Remember that great migration that I told you about earlier? Well, these folks are their descendants. They're just a generation or two out of the country themselves. There are also folks that are descendants of economic refugees from the Caribbean. And when those neighborhoods that their parents and grandparents worked to build become really trendy, they're some of the first people that are displaced by gentrification. And many of them are trying to move back to rural areas, but fine like I did, there's not much to go back to. In fact, that's how I ended up in TAMS. You see, we were living in D.C. at the time, and my family had fallen on some hard times. And my dad was looking for a place to stretch a dollar to raise his new family. And he had these fond memories of Tams, where his mom grew up. But of course, when we got there, we found a struggling town that was shrinking. So this is just one example of the connections between rural and urban. There's an urban, there's this whole ecosystem that we have to explore. But I wasn't done trying to find a, a really satisfying answer to the reason the election turned out the way it did, until I found this map. This map shows that if did not vote were a candidate in the US election, it would have won by a landslide. The things that we know about people who don't vote in the United States is that they tend to be younger, they tend to be poorer, they tend to be people of color, and they tend to be people who are from immigrant backgrounds. These are folks like I grew up with in Tams and my neighbors in Brooklyn, the economically and politically disenfranchised. And to me, that was a real revelation that to change our political and economic reality, we have to change our social and economic re our political reality, we have to change our social and econo economic reality. And I think the election was a wake-up call for a lot of us that we have to do that, that we have to start thinking about who do we leave behind in the process of urbanization. 
And I see that this community of rural to urban migrants, those economic refugees, are this sleeping giant, a massive community of millions that can help us do it. So I'm going to let you sit with that for a minute, because I just dropped a huge idea on you. Let's organize millions of people across the rural-urban divide. Now, that might seem impossible, but I'm an organizer, and I've worked on some pretty big campaigns that require mobilizing millions of people, like trying to raise the minimum wage in the United States. And I was looking for a good organizing model, because I knew that we need something that could touch people directly in their communities. So this lovely woman on the screen is my good friend, Dr. Antonietta Mercado. And she studies immigrant political organizations. She told me about hometown associations. These are these groups that immigrant communities form to create mutual, uh, sort of alliances for mutual support between their hometowns and the places that they've landed. And they are really prolific. There are thousands of them across the globe. In the United States alone, there are 6,000 Mexican immigrant hometown associations. But I was really inspired by one in particular, one that she works with called FIO. This is a federation of indigenous Mexican organizations that connect people across the US and Mexico border. And I want to tell you about the work of this group, because it's really impressive. They organize undocumented migrant workers who live in tents, in canyons, who make just a few dollars a day to give their time and resources to build schools and fund pageants and create scholarships in both the United States and Mexico. And they've amassed a considerable amount of political power. They were recently successful in getting the city of Los Angeles to change Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. They organized binational elections. They might elect someone in California who would serve as a mayor in Mexico. Now, I was super impressed. I was like, how do you get this group to do this? This is, you have to understand an underclass in both the United States and in Mexico with very little resources. And I learned it was because this process of tequio is at the heart of their work. Tequio is an indigenous cultural practice that means commitment to work. It means that everybody in the community is obligated to give their time, their energy, their talents for the betterment of the whole community, and in turn, the community looks out for your well-being. What's really important about Tecchio is that it allows for an economy where there is no money. Your commitment in Tecchio becomes your capital. And your standing in the community is tied not to a title or how much money you have, but the work that you are willing to do for that community. TAMS has little money, and no funders are lining up to throw money in this area. So I was really inspired. It showed us how, Tecchio shows us how to do a lot with a very little. It's also collaborative. It's not people putting on their capes and coming in and trying to save communities they left behind. It's people who are, see themselves as one community, regardless of geography, who are really committed to the well-being of all. And so I started a hometown association with some alumni from the seven villages that pour into our school district. And we are uniting people who've left and those who are back home to figure out how to sustain our community. This is a photo from our first meeting where we plan projects where we know rural areas are often left behind. We identified three core areas. Education, we want to bring back alumni to mentor our young people so they can start to imagine broader and more diverse futures for themselves. We want to focus on creating a sustainable local economy and explore community markets and co-ops. And for issues like flooding and housing, we need to encourage people to vote contact their elected officials, and run for office, because we have to engage our local governments. And like FIOB, we want a federation. Our small town isn't enough to do that bridging, right, between the rural and urban that's so important to do. We need a whole network of communities who are facing the same issues to advocate for the resources and infrastructure our small communities need. And it's really important to do this work right now. The number one job in the US is truck driving. It's what many of my former classmates ended up doing. With AI coming, these jobs are going to disappear, and we'll be facing a new wave of joblessness and migration. We often think that job creation is the answer to reviving struggling rural areas, but my hometown has seen many jobs come and go. That's why local interventions, like hometown associations, are so vital. 
They can create some stability where institutions and industry fail. If we can reimagine the rural-urban connection, we can ease the strains that we know are coming to cities by creating sustainable futures outside of them. Now I want to end by encouraging you all to join this movement, to start doing this bridging that's so essential. I know that not everyone in this room is from a rural area, and you're not all going to go and start hometown associations, but there is an intervention for you. Who do you see in your community that's being left behind by urbanization? It could be refugees that have just arrived to your town or residents that are being displaced by gentrification. Find a commitment and make sure that as our population shifts, that we can all thrive. Thank you. <laughs>